museum back to life. You know, people sit out on the front porch hoping people will come by. Go forth and do good. It's insane. I have the most understanding wife in the world. I treat everybody the same thing. Oh, that's the other thing I love about Marietta. It's like a melting pot. You are listening to Marietta Stories. Each week, veteran podcaster Bill Nowicki brings you the heartwarming, interesting, and fun stories from the people that make the community of Marietta, Georgia, a place to call home. Here's your host, Bill Nowicki. All right, here we are at Cool Beans Coffee Roasters. I'm outside with my friend Ira Blumenthal, and I've known Ira for quite a few years. He's really a renaissance man to me. He's just such an interesting guy, I've lived so many lives, and I think this will be a fascinating conversation to maybe pick through maybe two of your lives out of <laughs> eight, <laughs> Ira, I don't know, but uh, welcome to Marietta Stories Podcast, Ira. I am glad to be at a really cool place called Cool <laughs> yeah. Beans. I mean, for years, one of my kids would say, gee, Dad, that's really cool beans, and now I realize what, where it came yeah, from. it comes <laughs> from here in Marietta. No, uh, so... You didn't start out here in Atlanta, the Atlanta area. You grew up in New York City, am I correct? I was raised in New York, you know, went to the University of Maryland. There's nothing fiercer than a fighting turtle. You never, never forget right. that. And, uh, yes. and I was a student athlete, but I was also an English major. I read a quote. Now, I'm going back a lot of years now. I'm, I'm, I'm in my seventh decade, so this is a lot of years. And I read a mm-hmm. quote. It was a Navajo proverb. The measure of a man is how many lives he can jam into one lifetime. And I've never forgotten that. I must have been 19 years old. So every time an opportunity came along, whether it was business, whatever it might be, I kind of looked at it and embraced it. And people would say, you can't do all these things. And I, I also read a quote, those who say it can't be done need to get out of the way of those who are doing it. So, you know, I've kind of lived my life with the idea that if something comes along and I'm passionate about it, I'll do it. I was president of a $300 million food company. I have a, a best-selling book. I've written a number of books. I've made over 2,500 speeches on five continents. I am an associate producer on a, a Tribeca and Disney movie, I'm working with, uh, you know, some incredible people. Even, in fact, at 74 years old, got a phone call from Kennesaw State University, right down the road from Marietta, if you will, and I am now officially a Kennesaw State University men's lacrosse coach. So between really, you know, yeah, and it's kind of exciting. We got hurt by COVID, of course. But I've always worked in causes. So, for example, uh, Stephen Tyler of Aerosmith fame is a partner of mine. He and I created a foundation, a fund called Janie's Fund. And those listeners that might be familiar with Aerosmith's "Janie's Got a Gun." Mm-hmm. Steven Tyler wrote that song. It made millions of dollars, but he was always haunted by the dismal subject of a young girl being raped by her father and then going out and killing him. So we developed Janie's Fund to raise money yeah. for at- at-risk girls. We have five Janie's houses around the country. We've raised over $10 million in four years with the help of people like uh, not just Steven, but everyone from Johnny Depp to Leonardo DiCaprio to Sharon Stone to you name it. So I guess the bottom line is I do a lot. I don't know how I do it, but I just do it. And I'm always exhausted, and life is good. Well, one of the things that struck me about you is you're not afraid to try something new. And you said you're in your seventh decade. Uh, we're, we're doing virtual training together. Yeah. And it was surprising to me how quickly you came around or came along that journey. What would you tell other people in terms of hearing your story? You know, that fear that says, man, I don't know if I want to go that next step. A quote, when you're through learning you through. I'm proud to say that I'm 74 years old. I have the energy of a 25 year old, maybe the mentality of a 16 year old. I'm not sure. Yes, my kids and my wife. I really love the idea of learning. Now there's always fear. And now all of a sudden, because of COVID, you gave me the opportunity to do a virtual. Mm-hmm. I knew what the word virtual was, you know, and, right. and, and, I, and to your credit, to your credit and your, your uh, you know, associate, certainly Jeff Miller, you taught me something new. Was there fear? It wasn't fear. It was probably more excitement, mm. you know, but I'd come back and I'd, I'd turn to my wife and say, God, that was really, really cool. I enjoyed it. So I think that your listeners need to think about the following. Whenever a new opportunity comes, don't ask yourself, what's the risk I'm taking if I do this? Ask yourself, what's the risk I'm taking if I don't do this? Right, yeah. God bless this country and this world. Hopefully, you know, post pandemic, we'll be back on stage. We'll be back face to face but we really don't know. 
-hmm. So I'm excited that because of your help, I now have a new skill. And oh, by the way, I'm doing more virtual and I'm having fun with it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you're in my studio, the out, great outdoor. <laughs> Great outdoors, but well, yeah, I, I love the studio. There's, you know, you've got trees, you've got, you know. Uh, so let's lean into that COVID piece because mm -hmm. I think that's a critical thing that's going on in our whole society, in our whole world. It's very easy look behind you, right? Saying, look at all I've <clears throat> given up, or look at all that's changed. And and at your age, and I'm sure you've had challenges along your life. Sure. It sounds like you kept going. You just took that next step, and and there's a part of you that just has that grit what would you say to people that you know my job's been shifted i don't have the skills how do you pick yourself up by the bootstraps and how did you do it well you know there's a legendary legendary women's basketball coach named pat summit okay yeah. and uh, my wife kim and i have been involved with the summit family in fact the movie i alluded to earlier that's the movie that's being produced okay tribeca is production company the studio is Disney and and Kim and I my wife Kim and I are proud and honored to be on the we're associate producer of the movie Pat Summit's young son many many decades she passed away a couple of years ago but Pat Summit's young son Tyler seventh grade came home crying saying mom I was just cut by my seventh grade team now her first reaction was what coach in East Tennessee in their right mind would cut you know it's like right. it's like cutting Michael Jordan's son from your basketball team but she turned to Tyler and said, Tyler, did you work hard? And he said, no, Mom, I didn't. Well, she said, you know, Tyler, if you wear out those basketballs for the next year, you work hard, you'll make that team. Now, with tears in his eyes, Tyler turned to his mom and said, will you help me? Now, this is the message to the, the listening audience. And Pat Summit said, I will help you, but I will not start your engine. Every one of your listeners have been challenged with chaos and changes and social unrest and working off-site or, or kids taking online classes or whatever it is, we, we've all been challenged with it. We need to think about all the things we need to do, but we need to start our engine. We can't say tomorrow. Mm -hmm. you know, tomorrow never comes. It's got to be today. So I think that if your audience can embrace the fact that now, and don't get upset about things you can't control. You got a very important meeting, you're on I-75 and there's a traffic jam and you're late. You can't control that. I think COVID taught us all perspective. Mm. My wife and I travel a good bit because of business, consulting business, speaking business, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I kind of liked eating in my backyard. My wife was always a good cook, but now she ended up cooking four nights a week or five nights a week during COVID. Oh, by the way, we went to our closet. We found something dusty and old and relic -y. It was antique. It was called Scrabble. I and mean, we took Scrabble down from the shed. And all of a sudden, you know, this is kind of fun. So I was at a meeting where this priest shared a story with a group that was fascinating that your listeners need to hear and need to heed. He was giving the last rites to a man in his 90s. And the man in his 90s, maybe had minutes or hours or days left, turned to the priest and looked up and said, Father, why me? Why me? And this priest that was presenting this said, he had been a priest for 50 years. In 50 years, if he had a dollar for every time he heard that question, he would add a million dollars. Why me? Why did my kids, why are they disrespectful? Why me? Why did I get fired? Why me did my business fail? Why me did my marriage fail? Why me and woe is me? The gentleman who was about to pass on interrupted the priest and said, Father, you misunderstood me. Why was I blessed with the greatest marriage of marriages? Why was I blessed with incredible kids who are not only successful but very respectful? Why was I, why was I blessed with great friends and why was I blessed with great health up until this point? We have to all think about all the blessings we do have. Everyone listening to Marietta Stories right now can look over their shoulder and they'll see someone that's worse than they are. As bad as we think we have it, look at the bright side. Look at, you know, it's the old glass, empty glass, mm -hmm. you know, glass full. So, you know, to me, I guess the message is, yeah, COVID was a disaster. It was horrible. Think about the lives that were lost. Some of us lost friends. But you know what? We have to keep on fo moving forward. And, you know, it doesn't mean we forget it. You know, when you get a wound, the scar remains for a long time. But we need to learn from this, you know. You've lived along and obviously many different facets to your life. What do you think the next five, ten years brings for you? What things get you up in the morning and get you motivated? And what things do you really want to do that you haven't done yet? 
well, you know, getting up is always good. <laughs> right. You know, and then seeing if the legs work the way they're supposed to. When I think about tomorrow, it's less about my future. It's more about, I have 10 grandchildren with an 11th on the way. I think about them. I think about, you know, uh, hmm. one-year-old twin little girls, okay, Anderson and, you know, uh, and Evelyn or, or Lena, you know, who was a year and a half. And I think about my, my grandchildren from age, ages one through nine or 10. I think about their future. I've got to be the best Ira I can be physically, mentally, that I can be for them. Okay, you know, guess what? So I, I go to T-ball games and I watch T-ball, you know, I'm a coach for years and it's not the most exciting thing to watch, you know. Yeah. But got to be there for them. And, you know, and I got to, now, I don't know that I can bend over and pick them up as well as I used to. And every day that passes is probably going to be mm-hmm. less and less. But th- that to me is what the future is, is all about. Personally, we all have bucket lists. Two weeks ago, I had the pleasure of going to Wyoming. Had never been there. Really? Now I got 48 states checked off. I still have two more, Alaska and North Dakota. There is one thing that I've always wanted to do. Uh, My wife, Kim, and I were big fans of an incredible author that all your listeners had to read about in high school, junior high school. His name was Eric Blair, but you know him as George Orwell. And he wrote 1984. And today... In the year 2021, we're talking about, ha, Big Brother. Well, Big Brother was written in 1949, okay? So my wife, Kim, and I one day decided to write a musical comedy on the life of George Orwell. Made it more, you know, with songs like, Big Brother is watching you, watching all you do, watching all you do. Big Brother is watching you, and he knows your every move. Now, I'm not a Neil Simon, you know. I've never been a playwright, okay? I'm a playwright now because I wrote a play. Mm -hmm. We're currently working with some folks in New York to try to peddle it. I don't care if a YMCA daycare does my play, okay? I want to see it performed Uh only because, you know, we wrote the the music. So I would say twofold bucket list future, what has next? Number one, I, I, I want to see my kids and my grandkids grow and prosper and be there for them. And then secondly... This guy would love to be sitting in the audience, even if it's a YMCA or a local high school, and having someone clap and go, author, author. And, <laughs> and I hopefully, with the help of my walker, I can stand up and wave yeah, to the crowd. There you yeah, go. Yeah. But you know, you got to have a, you got to have a dream. Yeah. There was a wonderful Broadway show called South Pacific, and there was a song in there. If you don't have a dream, how are you going to have a dream come true? Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it sounds like, too, creativity is part of the essence of your passion so starting a new project doing these movies doing books uh, talking to different types of people trying virtual training how does that work out in your mind like you're saying oh here's a new challenge I'm going to take this on how do you choose what you work on I learned from a lot of people along the way you know I was a byproduct of a lot of people I was blessed with a relationship with Ted Turner you know right here in town okay you know uh, certainly a master builder relationship I traveled with Colin Powell as his opener you know Cal Ripken Jr. Um, both President Bush's not that they're all dear friends you know work right. with them around them and I tried to study some of the things that they did I'll give you an example when I was with Ted Turner at it was Terranea, a resort out in California, Palos Verdes Estates. We were both on a speaking. I was, you know, inter- introducing him and interviewing him as well. A reporter asked Mr. Turner. At that point, he was worth $7 billion. He was the largest landowner in the United States, whatever, other than the government. And they, they asked him something I've never forgotten. And I've tried to use this to filter opportunities. Mm-hmm. Mr. Turner, what do you attribute your great success to? You know, created CNN, you know, all this stuff. And Ted Turner responded with, I've mastered the art of taking a deep breath, pausing, and thinking. Now, I thought that was really profound mm. because most people would say, I surround myself with good people, right, right, you know, right. whatever it may be. I've been lucky. And I thought about that. So in answer to your question, opportunities come to us every day of the week, whether it be a friend, a neighbor, right, you know, right. a significant other, someone we bumped into in a coffee shop. And what I've tried to do, not as well as Ted, is to just take a deep breath and think about it. And do I really want to be in the shoe business? All right. No. <laughs> you know, and, but, you know, but then all of a sudden, you know, someone comes along with an idea and they ask you if you might help them or you might sit down and talk to them about it. And then you think about it, take a deep breath and say, what a, what a really good idea that is. You know, yeah, give me an example. I'm not involved in it. Um, I probably missed the, missed the opportunity, but I had a friend who was in robotics and developed these little mini robots that deliver food not drones, okay, these are on wheels. 
so that on college campuses, someone can place an order in their dormitory and this little robot would go from the student center to, you know, in terms of that. Big idea. Now, I thought about it, but I don't have a technology background. It wasn't something that excited me, but I think the key answer is passion. Right here in Marietta, Marietta story, I had the pleasure of meeting a gentleman named Otis Brumby. Mm-hmm. Okay, and we built a little bit of friendship. And Otis has, his family has an amazing, you talk about Marietta stories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, going back to the 1800s. Right. And Otis, of course, is the CEO of Times Journal and the, the publisher of Marietta Daily Journal. In chatting with Otis, we built a friendship, and Otis turned to me and said, gee, Ira, with your wealth of experience, and I've been a university professor at Michigan State and Notre Dame and writer and author, would you be? Would you consider writing a column for the right. Cobb Business Journal? Never wrote a column before. Hey, new opportunity. Well, I'm a writer. I'm a speaker. You know, I'm a teacher. That's all taking it to the, the page. Took a deep breath. Didn't have to think about it very long. And I said, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So I'm proud to say now that the third issue came out, and and I'm now a columnist, and I enjoy <laughs> it. And I wouldn't do it if I wasn't passionate about it. Right. You know. Kennesaw State University talked to me about having a, you know, joining the lacrosse coaching staff. I'm passionate about the sport. If they would have called me up and said, we're looking for a volleyball coach, I would have taken a deep breath and said, I never played volleyball other than gym class in eighth grade, you know. So Mm -hmm. I think it's about thinking about it, then coming up with a real decision, and then make sure you're passionate. I mean, I'm passionate about my column. I'm passionate about my column. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about working with you, Bill, your friend, but also being on Married to Stories. You know, I'm passionate about sharing my story and hopefully someone will learn from it. I'm passionate about screaming at umpires, making a bad call on my seven-year-old grandson. <laughs> You've had such a varied life. Looking back... you got to say, you got to get away from had. Had is like, Ira, rest in peace. No, yeah. I mean, you're having such... <laughs> had, yeah, that's... that's you. <laughs> You continue to have absolutely a, continue really, to have such a, a varied life an exciting life looking back what would you say you're most proud of let me let me answer it in two or three ways uh, i'm most proud of the fact that i was smart enough to identify the most incredible woman in the world my wife kim we all pass people in our lives you know at a party at a dance in a class in the hallway sitting in an airport whatever it is but when I, when I met Kim, it was love at first sight. Love, love, well, love of a person. It wasn't really, oh, what a, she's gorgeous. But I think that's one thing I'm proud of, the fact that, that I was smart enough to realize that this, this was my life changer. This, mm-hmm. was, this was the wind beneath my wings. On the secondary level, I am proud of all five of my children. I'm having something to do with the grandchildren as, as Papa, you know, yeah, yeah. DBA, Ira, you know. But um, they all turned out to be very stellar human beings, socially mm-hmm. responsible, good parents, those that are married with kids, and, and, um, and, and loving and kind with a great sense of family. Now, I give Kim more credit than myself on that, but I, I take pride on the fact that it's not about a book, it's not about a play, it's not about a song, it's not about a philanthropy, it's not about a business or brick and mortar. In the end, the lasting legacy of anyone is maybe the mark they've made on others. And, you know, and it's funny because there are times when I look at some of my kids and I see some of the traits that I had that I don't want to have, but I also see some of them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not surprising to me that my 36-year-old son is coaching Little League Baseball. Well, that's all he knew when he was a kid. Right, that's what yeah. Dad did. I live on a golf course that I play religiously once every six years. Yeah. Maybe not that much, mm-hmm. okay? Because I had to make the decision I was traveling a good bit in my life, in my business. Why would I travel Monday through Thursday, come home and then say to the kids, dad's going to yeah. be on the golf course with his right. buddy. So I coached baseball and that's all they saw. So I guess my answer is proud of the marriage, incredible marriage, 39 years as of you know, November will be 40. Proud of my kids. Um, yeah, I'm proud of things I've written and proud of the things I've done. I'm proud of the philanthropy I helped create with Stephen. But I, I, I would say that's the real, that's the real. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, that's the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So the kind of wrap things up, it's been a real fascinating time to get to know you. Uh, You know, I'm going to be 60 this year. I'm looking at, you know, what's the rest of my career look like? It was amazing to watch you kind of transform yourself, learning these new skills. We talked about the virtual training. Right. And it's kind of, you're kind of wired to do that. But I could tell from the way you acted that way the whole time is 
you're not getting older. You're not getting old as a person. You're staying young by doing things. What would you tell somebody like me that's turning 60? What should I think about the next 20 years of my life? Well, that, that's a great question. And you use two words I want to go back to. You talked about, you use the word old and you use the word older. Many of your listeners may not remember an iconic comedian named George Burns. <laughs> You know, I mean, this goes back to the old days. So those of you that, you know, uh, maybe you'll see a rerun of, of John Denver and George Burns and Oh God or something like that. Right, I think yeah. it was that movie. But George, he was, he was uh, you know, back in the 40s and the 50s, before my time even. But he once said something I thought was very memorable. And then I'll answer your question because it's a good segue. Everyone has to get older, but that doesn't mean you have to be old. Mm-hmm. I believe I'm the oldest lacrosse coach, college lacrosse coach in America at 74 years old. I'm sure there's probably, maybe there's someone else in Boise or something like that, right. but I got to be up in the top one or two percent. Right, right, right. And this, people, <laughs> people at 74 don't start a new career, okay, Correct. as a college coach, which I started, you know, needless to say, back in the late 60s. Yeah, you're going to get older. And I, I, tur- I turned to my lacrosse players and I said to them, when I was a young coach back in late 60s, I ran with the team. I put on a helmet, I scrimmage with the team. Oh, yeah. Kids, I'm going to give you as much knowledge as I can, educate and inspire you, but I'm not going to run with you because I can't. And I'm not going to scrimmage with you because I can't. But I blow a hell of, I blow a, hell of a whistle. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> you know, so, so to me, you know, you're going to get older, which means, you know, the knees are going to get right, a little right, stiff, yeah. okay, and, you, you know, you're going to, uh, my wife is convinced that I definitely have a hearing problem. I think it's selective, but that's my own <laughs> opinion. But, t- but, but he- here's what's interesting is, and Bill, this is, a, this is the message for you and your other listeners. Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel at 92 years old. Jonas Salk mm. cured polio at 78 years old. Ben Franklin became the president of the state of Pennsylvania, okay, in his 80s, mm. right? You can, uh, Louisa May Alcott wrote Little Women, the first book she ever wrote in her 70s. I know people, you know people that are 70 or 80 years old mm. and they have their young at mind and their vim and their vigor, right, and, right. right? And then you know people with 30 who are over. I think, forget about the physical, think about the mental. Yeah. Everyone that I've ever met, be it guys like Ted Turner or Jack Bell's a master builder, okay, who built a, you know, amazing, amazing human being, the Peabody Hotel, you know, in Memphis, Tennessee, or or Mike Illich, an old friend of mine, just passed away actually in his 90s, you know, who was the owner of the Detroit Tigers, the Detroit Red Wings, you know, created Little Caesar Pizza. Even though they were in their 70s, and their 80s, and 90s, they still came to work every day. Now they may not have stayed eight hours, right, know, right. okay. So the advice is, don't stop doing. Okay, whatever doing is, if it's go out and give lectures at libraries to little kids, okay, or be a volunteer, I think the more active you are, the longer you're going to be around. I'm never going to say no. My kids, you know, gee, dad, they want me to, like, retire. There's no way I'm going to retire. I say I'm I'm rewiring, I'm not retiring. Mm -hmm. There's no way. And I'd turn around to them and say, if you love me and you want to see see me to be around as long as I can possibly be, then don't stop me. You know, because I'll turn to my kids and say, hey, got a new idea. Come on, another new idea, Dad? Yeah, but why not? So I would say Mm -hmm. stay active. And if you don't have things to be active about, go out and create them. You know. So let me ask you, Bill. I'll interview you for a second. You play a musical instrument? I do. What do you play? Trumpet. Trumpet. Okay. Well, do you play in a band? No. No. I haven't. I haven't in years. Like decades? Probably, yeah. Probably, okay. There's probably 50 opportunities in greater Atlanta for you to turn around and say, I'd love to sit in and play trumpet. Okay, now let's go back to Pat Summit. As your friend Ira, I might introduce you to someone, but you, right. you have to you turn, have the, turn, the turn the you turn the turn the key, yeah. and that's what it's really about. You look around now, and you think about the challenges and the chaos and the, the, that we have in our society right now. There are lots of kids that could use your wisdom. Mm. There are lots of kids that are lost. Right. Think about all the kids that never had a graduation in high school because of COVID, or mm-hmm. think about it. You know, so I guess my long-winded response to you is, you know, Mark Twain once said, "Age is nothing but mind over matter." If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, I think we should stop it right there, Ira. I'm not going to be able to top that. But I, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate our relationship and what you've done for me in the podcast and what I've learned just watching you go through the type of 
uh, shift you had to make in the virtual world, and I appreciate uh, you and what you brought to the listeners. So thank you. Well, Bill, thank you, and and, and I, I appreciate what you're doing for anyone that's on here. To you know, in your own way, you're educating and inspiring because yeah. every one of your guests, hopefully myself as well, had one pearl that maybe yeah. they can take away with, and and I consider you a friend. I'm honored to be on. Yeah, great. Thanks. That was Mr. Ira Blumenthal. You can reach him at Ira Speak. Dot com and he's a consultant and speaker and he's been doing great work for us on branding. It's Bill Nowicki saying thank you for listening to Marietta Stories Podcast. You can reach us at MarietaStories.com. Please subscribe, give us a review on Apple Podcasts and Season 6. We're teaming up with Marietta Visitors Bureau to bring you some of the great people that make Marietta great. 